Yo, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy Naruto Explain here, bringing you guys another board to Two Blue Vortex chapter review. And now that chapter three is done in the books, man, do we got a lot to talk about from Boruto's Rasengan on Uzuhiko having beyond planetary levels of power to the strong implication that Boruto's been trained by Kashi and Koji, potentially knowing Sage Mode to Boruto versus Kawaki being teased. The truth about the ten tells in this chapter. This new Boruto series is clearly keeping its foot on the gas by letting us know Kishimoto's pen isn't playing games with us because what we're seeing here is that the Boruto who we knew at the end of Boruto part one, that Boruto is not the guy that is here right now. That Boruto is gone. This Boruto is simply him and him needs no reintroduction the same way that Raid Shadow Legends doesn't need one because they're also the sponsor of today's video. Raid Shadow Legends is beloved by millions of players worldwide for more than its high quality graphics which can guarantee a PC like experience even on your phone. Raid offers more than 700 unique champions which can be used for different strategies and teams to complete the most difficult challenges such as dungeons, bosses, and PvP arena, and especially raids Hydra Clash where you and other four clans are competing to see who can smack the Hydra the hardest. It's full of surprises, updates happen every month, and in October, Raid is planning plenty of tricks and treats for those you guys who enter the Raid Yard. All you have to do is download Raid using my link below, copy your in-game ID, and then head over to raidyard.valerium.com between October 15th and November 10th, and you get the chance to earn some amazing in-game items and real life prizes ranging from a Halloween themed champion to Amazon gift cards with a total value up to $20,000 and if you're an existing player you can head to radyard.valerium.com and use a special promo code to earn a small gift. As anime fans you're really gonna want to earn Raid Sun Wukong Champion by logging in 7 different days between August 22nd and October 23rd to get the iconic champion. With all this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you have haven't already start playing by using my link or scan the QR code on the screen to get a free starter pack and in-game loot. So what are you waiting for? Hit my link, pass the tutorial to sharpen your skills and also help me boost the content quality for you guys to enjoy and I'll see you guys on the battlefield. Thank you again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Right away, we can see that Code is spooked by Boruto's for seeing out Uzuhiko, and it's because while Code might not be the smartest guy out there, it's something we've been told countless times by multiple characters in universe, even Code can see that Boruto is using something different from all the other Rasengans that he's seen in the past. Back when Code was hunting down Boruto, battling him off and on again for the last two out of the last three years, it's basically a primal instinct that every animal has when they know they're in the presence of a predator that can kill them. Code has been talking a really big game, but he can see just as we as the audience can, that something has changed in Boruto and that this Boruto is not bluffing. This is Boruto who is extremely confident that this new jutsu can kill Code if it connects and for a moment we see Code actually pause as he tries to discern the situation. He starts going through his mind all the different Rasengans that he's seen Boruto use, namely that this looks similar to the vanished Rasengan, but Code notes that that jutsu is invisible to the naked eye and that it's used via ninja trickery meant to ambush the target when they least expect it. Yet this Rasengan is something that while Code can't see the chakra in the shape of a ball, he can clearly see chakra rings around the jutsu being used and he knows that Boruto is preparing something which leads him questioning why Boruto is approaching him with such overwhelming confidence because this is clearly out of character. Based off of this, we can conclude that the last few times that Boruto and Code mixed it up, Boruto was a scared child who fought against Code and he was running away every chance that he got. Very similar to how Trunks was in the Dragon Ball manga where he's running from Cyborg 17 and 18, running for his life, never battling them head up until he gets strong enough to defeat them. However, what we see here is that this current version of Boruto, he isn't running, he's walking right towards Code. And it's enough to spook Code into going into one of his claw marks that are on the ground to try and ambush Boruto, which in theory, it isn't a bad idea. If it was like 90% of the other Rasengans we've seen in the series, where they have to be rammed into the target, at least by getting behind Boruto in his mind, he stands a chance of being able to adjust to when Boruto turns around to try and connect the attack. Yet when Ko does attempt to do this, Boruto looks completely unfazed by what just happened and shows a key element of what we saw in Naruto, which is the move hidden behind the move. Boruto has already set up a checkmate of code, but code is too dumb to realize it. In a way, it's very similar to what Shikamaru did when he had already set up potential check marks for Idan and Kakazu in the Akatsuki suppression arc, where he had Kakashi stab Kakazu in the heart with the right key and then grab some of Kakuzu's blood as insurance to trick Hidon when Shikamaru fought him later on one on one. Boruto did something very similar here. He lured Code into a false sense of security and it makes a lot 
lot of sense. Boruto has seen Cold fight numerous times now, from the battle in Boruto Naruto Next Generations to all the battles that happen in the time skip arc. And it goes back to another key element of what we were told in Naruto, which is that the more times you use your signature move, which in this case would be Cold's claw marks and that teleportation of them, your enemy will be able to plan around said jutsu if you don't kill them right away. Boruto used Code's own jutsu against them to get close enough to launch the attack without Code actually realizing. Code arrogantly thinks that he stopped the attack when he grabs Boruto's wrist, but had he been paying attention, he would have been able to see that despite grabbing Boruto by the wrist, the wind chakra rings around Boruto that's still active, which in turn means this brand new jutsu that he knows nothing about is also still active and that he needs to be cautious. What we see here is Code failing to not fall into the same trap that he did briefly when he fought against Boruto in part one of the story. There were a few times during that first Boruto versus Code fight where Code, despite having the upper hand on Boruto, Boruto was still able to get the drop on Code a few times because Boruto isn't just a skilled shinobi. He's a prodigy son of the seventh Hokage, the most unorthodox shinobi in the history of the ninja world. He is the grandson of the fourth Hokage, one of the biggest prodigies in the entire history of the ninja world. And he's got the blood of the Hugo clan, one of the four noble clans of Konoha and one of the clans that have one of the strongest connections to Kaguya. You don't underestimate someone like Boruto just based off of his genetics alone. Even if he doesn't have the talent of those in his bloodline, you still treat him with that level of caution due to the respect that is owed by the name that he carries. And unfortunately for Code, Boruto's proving that he's worth the fear that comes from having the genetic background that Boruto has. Boruto remarks to Code that the jutsu is already halfway done and at this point Boruto can kill Code at any point if he wants to and it's in that moment that Code realizes that the chakra rings have gone from being wind-like rotations around Boruto to now transferring to his arm and surrounding his body as time goes on. What he doesn't realize is that Boruto has trapped him both by letting Code use his claw marks to get close and by blocking Code with his sword to keep pushing back with just enough force to force Code to stay in place all while distracting him from the jutsu being released onto Code's body. It's as Kakashi said in part one, a ninja must see through deception and Code not being a ninja is unable to see past the deception used by a ninja, further highlighting the symbolism of what we're seeing unfold. Boruto is a shinobi fighting a cyborg, which is a human with mechanical enhancements in a story that has dealt with the conflict of where does science fit in this world of ninja? Can ninjutsu and science coexist without conflict? And we're seeing Boruto embody the heart of a shinobi in this battle, just as he told us in Boruto chapter 80 when he said that he was still a shinobi to Momoshiki. It's very beautiful writing to see this come full circle. Boruto then tells Code, either take me to the Tentails and I'll release this jutsu or you can die here. And Code being as arrogant as he is, despite knowing that Boruto has clearly done something to his body, refuses to see this as anything other than a bluff, which is what starts the downfall of Code in this chapter. No attack he launches at Boruto actually lands. He misses literally every single attack and it baffles him, which then plays into Boruto's hand because Code is lashing out in anger and rage, letting emotion cloud his judgment, and he doesn't realize until Boruto slams his jutsu into his stomach that it wasn't Boruto dodging him, nor was his a genjutsu or even a clone jutsu. Boruto's body was betraying him and throwing off his equilibrium, which means he was throwing off his balance. It's at this point that Boruto completes the Rasengan Uzuhiko, and the sheer force of the attack sends Code flying across the village so hard that Code is drawn with a very expressive shot of his face in agony and in so much pain that it looks like Boruto almost forced that boy to open up that one eye that he got the scar over during the time skip. And what's most impressive about this is that Code is using the Karma Seal, which means this version of Code without limiters is stronger than Jigen, and Boruto is dogging out a beyond Jigen level threat without using his Karma Seal. This Boruto is extremely powerful. When Boruto compliments Code on being able to withstand the Jutsu that he used, Code doesn't seem to get that there was sarcasm baked into Boruto's comment because Boruto knows what's coming next, and Boruto isn't the only one who knows it's coming, so too does Damon by the looks of it. And this is where things get really interesting. So Ada and Damon are shown, and the cyborg sibling duo, they're in a conversation. Ada's informing Damon of what Boruto just did, and she's confused as to how this is different than a normal Rasengan, and goes as far as to call an even simpler version of it. But, but Damon uses Ada's play-by-play -play and his own observation what's happening to explain to us as the audience what really took place. Boruto has shaken the entire planet with a casual use of the Rasengan, and Damon refers to it as a jutsu that uses the entire 
entire planet's rotation. Eerily enough, is actually right, and Damon is excited about this, which can only mean we're about to get a huge payoff for a major subplot from Boruto Naruto Next Generation. At the end of the manga, we saw Damon beat the brakes off of Boruto and Kawaki inside of the house they're staying at, and then after the Shinjutsu was cast and everyone's memories of Boruto and Kawaki were swapped except for Ada and Damon, Sword and Sumire, and Boruto and Kawaki, Damon tells Boruto to make sure he takes his time during the time skip to get stronger because when he returns, Damon expects Boruto to be strong enough that Damon can fight him at full power for the first time in his entire life. What we see here is Kishimoto using Damon's excitement to remind us as the audience that this isn't a subplot that's been forgotten about. We're either going to get that fight or it's going to be a red herring, but the subplot itself has not been forgotten about. After Code falls onto the ground, Boruto explains to Code that his death sentence is finally at play and that he should consider this a counterattack, a defense if you will, by the very planet that Code wanted to destroy by harvesting a chakra fruit. Boruto says that his Rasengan absorbs chakra from the planet itself and that the rotation of his jutsu is tied to the planet. Just as the chakra running through Code's body on that attack won't ever stop, it's just like the rotation of the planet. It will always rotate and that the damage will continue to build inside of Code over time and eventually kill him. And I love this because this is a huge, mega easter egg if you're a hardcore Naruto fan. So if you go back to 2015, when Boruto the movie was being made, the movie novelization, which was written by Ukyo Kodachi, the former writer of Boruto, and told a complete story of the final screenplay for the movie that Kishimoto and Kodachi wrote together, showing things that weren't in the movie or fully expounded upon. One of the things that we learned in that story is that Fuse Momoshiki could draw on some of the power from the planet that they were fighting on, some of the stars in that dimension, and from Momoshiki's other interconnected dimensions in order to power himself up. It wasn't all the chakra from those dimensions, it was only a portion, but it was enough that when he got desperate fighting Naruto and Sasuke, it allowed Momoshiki to power up and battle them as equals for a brief period of time. Think of what Momoshiki did in that novel, and think of what Boruto's doing here, similar to a Genki Dama from Dragon Ball. It doesn't take all the energy of the planet. It only takes a safe amount of the health, i.e. the Genki, of the people on the planet and the planet itself, but it's enough to do serious damage to those who are hit by it, and we see a similar thing done here. Code is in serious pain from this attack and it will only grow worse, making it absolutely overpowered. Boruto takes the time to tell Code, if I release this jutsu, your life will be spared. But he says his condition is that Code takes him to the Tentails and it's here we see some of those Naruto genetics in Boruto because even when facing Code in this manner, he's still willing to give him mercy and allow him to redeem himself. But Boruto isn't above killing Code if it comes down to it. Or rather, as we'll see in a moment, he wants Code to believe that he's gonna kill him in this very moment when in reality it's Boruto setting up another trap for Code and Code being so ruled by his emotions that he can't see the trap that he's walked into. What we're seeing here are those Minato genetics on full display and what we're seeing is how during this time skip Sasuke has raised Boruto into the Shinobi Shinobi because the level of ninja trickery that he's pulling off here where it's back to back tricks that's showing how big of a fool that Code actually is because Code is consistently falling for Boruto's trap. However, before Boruto can get much further into his conversation with Code. Kawaki chooses that moment to try and kill Boruto by using a sneak attack. Yet Boruto casually dodges the attack and it isn't until Boruto lays eyes on Himawari that Boruto's stone cold expression changes and we see him soften his face around the edges of the eye and the mouth and we see the hurt in Boruto's eyes as Himawari calls him by his name and not by Onichan like she normally does when she refers to him as big brother. She's never called Boruto by Boruto's own name. In the manga, it's always been Onichan or Big Brother. It's a gut punch for Boruto, a reminder of what he's lost. And as we've seen in both the manga and the anime, Boruto has a huge soft spot for his sister. She's the reason he got so mad at Naruto during the tuning exams because Naruto ruined his sister's birthday by sending a shadow clone there and dropping the cake. It's as the 48 Laws of Power, a book by Robert Greene, discusses in detail. Law number 33 says discover every man's thumbscrew, which basically means even 
even the strongest of men have a weakness that they hide. And if you discover said weakness, you can bend them to your will. And Kawaki knows this. And that's what I love about their entire interaction here, especially when Kawaki sends everyone away. He's letting Boruto know that he knows which buttons to push on him. Boruto's biggest thumbscrew is his family. It's why he was almost trapped by Kawaki and Boruto Naruto next generations. After Kawaki sealed away Naruto and Hinata and Boruto was rushing there. Kawaki initially was going to wait for Boruto at his house when Boruto would be the most emotional, but instead he heads him off and tries to attack him at the Hokage Monument. Had Kawaki have waited, he probably would have been able to kill Boruto because Boruto would have been too emotional in that moment at the house seeing all the damage. This is likely why he kept Himawari somewhat close. It's a strategic advantage over Boruto that Kawaki has. So you can tell that Boruto's thinking to himself, look at how much Himawari's grown over this time. Her hair's gotten longer. She's clearly grown a few inches. However, upon seeing Shikadai and Team 10 arrive, Boruto's face hardens and he tells him to stop interfering with this conversation with Code. And just as Code attempts to escape, Kawaki uses Sukuni Hikona to shrink the claw marks and tells Shikamaru they can kill Code if they need to. Yet, Kawaki has so much of a hard on for Boruto that he can't see reason. He's a lot like Code, someone who Kawaki hates. He's blinded by his own emotions, which allows for Code to summon a Tentails Claw Grind in an effort to successfully pull off a multi step actual plan of escape. The Claw Grind appears, Kawaki hits it, Kawaki's held in place, and Code jumps through the claw mark on the back of the Claw Grind in order to escape to safety, showing that while Code might be an idiot, he still can use a little trickery himself as well. After Kawaki sends Team 10 and Himawari away to deal with the claw grinds, he tells Boruto that he's going to finish his business with them, and we again see Boruto is about to fight someone blinded by their emotion. But this time, Boruto knows that when he's fighting Kawaki, he's likely going to have to fight a lot more seriously, likely not be able to use the Rasengan Uzuhiko because it's not his goal to kill Kawaki, just as it was never Naruto's goal to kill Sasuke. Boruto, when that battle finally occurs, is going to fight with killing intent. However, it's going to be with self-restraint to not kill Kawaki, which is going to be a huge testament to the control he has over his power. It's a testament to his skill to strike with killing intent, but not actually kill. However, while this is going on, Sarda informs the other Chunin, as well as us as the audience, that the claw grinds that ate the Chunin, they didn't actually die. They're alive for now. And Sarda makes a conclusion based off the information that she's seen, which is that if the claw grinds are made out of the Tentails and the Tentails is meant to eat Otsuki, then by instinct, the claw grinds are going to eat humans. And we see another sign of what Boruto warned Code about, which is that by giving his chakra to the Tentails and to these claw grinds, he's changed them beyond Code's comprehension. And we see Sarda with that limited information she has at her disposal, she comes to that same conclusion. While Kawaki makes fun of Boruto for copying Sasuke's sense of style, which they look very similar, it's worth noting that this is the first time since the first chapter of the series that we've heard a mention of Sasuke, yet we've never actually seen him, which now means that Sasuke, that death clock, is still being watched, waiting for a sign of life of our favorite Uchiha. However, while this lack of proof of life for Sasuke might concern some of you, what's worth noting is that Boruto maintains his sarcastic nature when speaking to Kawaki, and he puts emphasis on Himawari still being alive and in good health, which means as of right now, Boruto isn't concerned about Sasuke. When Kawaki says he's going to kill Boruto inside of his hometown, it's worth noting that Kawaki is saying this when nobody's around. And most importantly, it's worth noting that Boruto says dying in Konoha is not something he's opposed to. However, that day won't be today. Now, this is yet another subtle nod to something that we've been seeing ever since the Naruto series creator Masashi Kishimoto took back over the writing for Boruto's manga, which is yet another reference to Samurai 8. The manga Kishimoto tried to write and had a former assistant draw that got canceled. We have Boruto, a character whose powers allow him to see into the future, saying dying in Konoha isn't something he plans to do today. Whilst Iza write this off as Boruto saying he's not dying, period. Given how Samurai 8 ended with Hachimaru dying in a sacrificial way, becoming a god, and transcending above life, death, rebirth, space, and time itself, while also being connected to all of his loved ones, in particular, a romantic love interest in and from Samurai 8, it's something to keep your eye on when it comes to Boruto. However, what we see next is what I meant earlier when I said that Boruto was playing another trap for Code because Boruto has a toad inside of his collar of his jacket that he's been in communication with the entire time. He wanted to create a sense of helplessness for Code, where Code would have to retreat. Also, Boruto could find the location of the Tentails and go destroy it. After all, he knew there would be a better chance of hell freezing over Jada Pekin Smith not embarrassing herself by embarrassing her husband when she talks about Tupac before 
before Cole willingly took him to the Tentels, which is why Boruto set up that multi-step plan in order to get to the location himself. When Boruto and Cole first fought, Boruto appears to have actually placed one of the toes on a Cole's body, likely when he slammed that Rasengan Uzuhiko into his stomach. And this is a clear sense of a throwback to when Kashin Koji slipped a toad on a Konohamaru during the Rasengan clash. It's there that we see that Bugs actually been swallowed up by one of the claw grimes and turned into a tree. And Boruto's gotten his eyes on the Tentails, all without Code ever realizing what happened and that he's been played. And when we see Boruto weep in the hand sign at the end of the chapter, Boruto looks very confident that he's about to pull a fast one on Code with yet another attack that Code doesn't see coming. Will this be Boruto using reverse summoning to get himself into Ishiki's dimension where Code and the Tentails are located? It's possible. The same way it might be possible for Boruto to trigger some other jutsu via a Toad summon that sneaked into the dimension, but I don't think it's going to get blown up. That doesn't seem like Boruto style and that small toad isn't going to pack enough of a punch to actually destroy the Tentel. This obviously brings the elephant in the room, which is did Kashin Koji train Boruto? And it does look like all signs are pointing towards that, which is going to be interesting to see how this gets explained. But if he did train him, Sage Mode Boruto is something we do have to keep our eyes on, but I'll leave that to you guys to discuss in the comment section. But I will have a video on Sage Mode Boruto dropping in a few days, so make sure to keep notifications turned on.